Yeah, this is the thanks for the introduction. Do you want the lights on? Or um, I'm fine. How, is that all right now? Yeah. So the uh, hello third Wells presentation is a very Wells dominating session. Yeah, I was just thinking uh, that. Great. <laughs> uh, love the Cardiff kind of two so far. Um, hello. So um, just to link with the previous discussion, this presentation it uh, it jumps on the discussion between facts and stories and all the discussion between uh, a reality and interpretation. So I really liked Martin's uh, two London Tube maps. So you have the interpretation map on the side when you see that after, you know, after London Bridge is uh, uh, Southwark. But the other map, which actually shows the geographical background of the London Tube, Martin said this is the reality because you could understand the tube. You can you can understand how the tube is extended, or which areas actually the tube covers. So uh, our presentation uh, it's now we are in the interpretation. So we have the past pyramids, the Parthenon because we are Greek both, uh, even for coming to will. Uh, Pyramids of Egypt, then you have, oh, sorry, stay there, don't Jones. <laughs> so, uh, so you have the Professor Jones there, who is the archaeologist, uh, who is really literally thinking to, uh, uh, in order to write the story from the past. Uh, all right, so the archaeologist is the novelist, is the author who gets the facts, because Parthenon is there, it was there, and the pyramid is there, so that's the facts. And there is the archaeologist who do hello Jones, and uh, do some excavation, and then tries to write a story, uh, which is the narrative that we're discussing so far. So the most of the discussion today is how to communicate this narrative. So it's, it's, it starts from that point, and goes forward, and then that sometimes just jumps back to uh, Professor Jones, and uh, says, look, Mr. Jones, uh, sorry, Professor Jones, now you need to do that in order to communicate the narrative better. So I don't know, deep mapping, or uh, uh, scenography, or whatever. Um, but we would, I mean, I think archaeology, I don't know how many are archaeologists in that room, I, I, I hope the, the majority. I, I feel that archaeology now is living a mid-interpretation crisis. So uh, particularly after uh, Leopard's, Hodder's Leopard's tale. So is it the time to, to try to understand the past instead of the interpreted the past. So I think uh, now we sh we live in the performative turn. So we, we're starting understanding that all human practices are performed, any human action is a presentation of the self. We have the need to conceptualize how human practices is related to their contexts. Uh, we need to go beyond the sociological symbolic structures and stress the active social construction of reality as well as the way that individual behavior is determined by the context. And then uh, how the performance, so if we understand that everything is a, is, is a performance and has an audience, then performance functions both as a meta functions both as a metaphor and an analytical tool. And that provides a perspective, a perspective yeah, for framing and analyzing social and cultural phenomena. So to get today, we're going to discuss both the metaphor and performance as the analytical tool. So I don't know how many of you have been in, in Greece and have seen a Greek uh, Panigiri festival or been in a Greek nightclub. <laughs> Do so. It's a, one of the 1,000 things that you have to do before you die according to National Geographic. <laughs> so uh, at some point during the night, you, you see this solo male dance, we call it Zebekiko, it's a very old dance, comes from the Asia Minor and the Greeks that they used to live there before they uh, kicked them out. Uh, so the, the, there's a male dancer who is performing and trying to express his inner thoughts, passions, and you could manipulate your dance in order to do that. There is objects that are linking the dancer with the audience, so famous smashing plates, and not anymore in Greece, but you could find this in London. I was, I was there. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but also, I mean, there's, there's many other things. Uh, the, the dancer is dancing around the glass, if he would like to be very passionate about, or if he would like to be brutal, he's dancing around the cigarette. 
and carry on. We can discuss this later. But I found this, and particularly this, this is from a very nice graphic novel, an American guy, I forgot his name, did it. It's called The Betico, and it's, one of the, uh, it's the same guy who's working with uh, Miller in uh, all, the, all his novels. So uh, I really like, because you could see all the different positions that the dancer can get, and also the audience was smashing plates to his dance. All right, so performance is a bodily practice that produces meanings. And this is the point that we would like to put a full stop. It's the presentation of reactualization of symbolic systems. So it's the guy who would like to express himself. And you can, if you know the context, and this is important, if you know the context and you see the dancer, you can understand if he's expressing passion, brutality, grief, or happiness. All right? But also, this happens through living bodies as well as lifeless mediating objects, smashing plates. <laughs> so, our project, our research, is a two, it's a double carriageway, if you like. So, on the one hand, you have drama in order to communicate the archaeological narrative to wider audiences. Pretty much what we discussed today. So, we have the narrative, we made the narrative, and we're going forward, trying to, uh, you know, to give our narratives to uh, community engagement, schools education, museum education, or even fellow archaeologists. So we can do a trauma uh, workshop in order to explain you my own personal research in the Balkan Neolithic caves. But also, and that's linked to Tuchenic work as well, we're trying to see how archaeologists, what's the analytical, what's the methodological and theoretical tools that archaeologists used in order to create the narrative. So can drama, or, and here is an open plan for discussion, because we are dealing with drama, not we, Tina is dealing with drama, I have no, I'm, 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 I'm very bad at these things. But, so she's dealing with drama, but I think here, in this discussion, we can incorporate any kind of art, and this is the dynamic of this discussion. Can design work, can visual art work as a tool for archaeologists to create a narrative, to understand the past? That's a, that's a question that I cannot answer so far. So from, from this point, I'll come back uh, to discuss this lane in a minute, I think in five minutes. But I'll pass now to Tina to discuss, uh, to show you the first part of the project that we have accomplished so far. And this is using drama in order to communicate the archaeological narratives in other, in a wider audience. So. Good afternoon. There we are. And let's go for drama! <laughs> so, people usually confuse drama with theatre. Drama and theatre are completely two different subjects, two different things. We'll deal with drama today, and precisely, drama means action. When you get involved into something, when you have to do something. We mostly focus on the verb part of the drama thing. It comes from the means from the verb vrao, vro, which means we have to do something, we have to get involved into something. It's not acting, it's act, two different things. So, why drama? There are a few basic things that drama offers to people. So let me read a few stuff and then I will explain. So participants engage, because when we have to act all together, I ask you to do something, you do something back, we have a communication. Now you look at me and you nod, you see, you do something. That's how it works. Develops participant intellectual, social, physical, emotional, moral dynamics, engaging their thoughts, feelings, bodies and actions. Because to do something you have to think, you have to feel, and you actually react to a stimulus. So, Archaeologists can give a stimulus and we can do the actual action part. Drama challenges participants to make meaning of their world, experience, feel, interpret. So using the drama you can actually ask participants to get physically and mentally and emotionally involved and explain what they see, what they touch, what they smell. Empowers participants to understand and influence their world through exploring roles, objects, and situations. It can be an object, an artifact. artifact, yeah. It can be an object, it can be a situation, it can be a condition. It can be anything you want it to be. It, 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 it can be a story. So, what else? 
Drama allows participants to explore, shape and symbolically present ideas and feelings and the consequences. Because the good thing with drama is there is this imaginative umbrella that protects the participants and lets them expose themselves without getting hurt, without being in front of the audience, as theatre reveals everything in front of the audience. Because in our situation, drama is between us, between the place where we hold the whole dramatic situation. Also, drama can move and challenge values, cultures and identities because obviously drama can be used with any age, with any colour, any race, any background, with anyone. You don't have to be a specialist, you don't have to be someone with particular characteristics. You can be anyone you want to be and you can participate. Also, it draws on many different contexts from past and present societies and cultures. So drama can work in any situation. It's quite adaptable. So, however, what kind of drama? There are lots of dramas. Educational dramas, performative dramas, dramas for purposes, drama for mental health issues, drama for discipline issues, drama for many different aspects. We will focus on process drama. The facilitator and the participants work together aiming at creating a setting in order to explore, solve, deal with an issue or a series of issues. And the most important thing about process drama is that the intention of it is to take place between us and not for an audience. We explore and expose ourselves for ourselves. So there's no someone to judge, clap or disapprove. It's just between the participants and the facilitator. So, we put all these lovely theories into a project and it quite worked. So, uh, I'll first explain the structure. We have the three E structure. Exposition, exploration, exhibition. Actually, if you have any linguistic background, you can easily realise that it's the structure of an essay with the introduction, main no part, and conclusion. Mm -hmm. I'm a teacher. So, 3E is an application for interpreting, exploring, and reconstructing participants' own narratives about a target object or notion. It's principle derived from process drama and communicative language teaching. So, more or less, you give a stimulus to the group, to any kind of group, and the stimulus can be anything, an idea, an object, an artefact, something that derives from excavation maybe, and then let them explore it and create and fill the narratives themselves. To be more specific, let's talk about archaeology. Communicating the archaeological narrative. The embodied learning norm that drama supports can be a valuable tool to communicate the archaeological narrative in museum education, community and social context. In other words, the project I'm going to talk about took place in a museum, that's why. Um, process drama in particular is a pret a tool that can be adjusted in facilitators and community archaeology needs. It's very flexible because you shape it and more or less the facilitator sets the limits most of the time. Our 3 e way is a structural tool that can be used as a mainframe to tailored workshops. You can cut and face it as you wish, more or less, because the structure is very flexible. So, any guess? Any previous knowledge? Pablo. Do you know what it is? Pablo. Yes! The red lady of the pavilion. Not really a lady, but anyway. So, let's talk about this. Let's meet the red lady of the pavilion. The main goal of this workshop was to assist children um, using music and drama to reconstruct their own narrative about don't, what don't happened. Don't we'll, just, we'll, we'll flood into the general discussion, you're right. So, more or less, we've been to the museum, we had 47 participants of mixed ages because it was half to all the people attended the museum workshops. We have adults and kids, and they participate in the workshop following the structure of so your exploration, exposition, and uh, ex exposition, exploration, exhibition. And uh, the workshop lasted 55 minutes and it took place at the M M Natural History Museum of Wales. So in this workshop, participants had the opportunity through the drama and music activities to embody and imagine how life used to be back to that era and experience how people used to live and interact. They play with pebbles, they make the noises, they touch the wood and all the um, materials we could relate back to that era, watch the video get exposed gradually to the whole situation of the Red Lady of the Pavilion and 
Here is the paper. It has been published in the drama magazine of National Drama. Here's reference if you would like to have a look at the paper. And Yes, yes. Um, it's time to pass it over. So I'll go very quickly. The bad thing with the teachers is that very Sorry. analytical. So I'll pass uh, forward to quickly to the uh, how we can use drama to understand the past. So I think we've seen this before, uh, that what drama can do. I know, if you replace some words, then participants can make meanings of past words. So we can empower participants to understand and influence the past, the past was through exploring roles, objects, and situations. I mean, red is what we can what it are the facts that we can provide. So we have the objects, and we can we can provide the roles. Uh, some, the, in archaeology, it's difficult to reconstruct the situation, and this is a big discussion again. So I didn't put this in red. Uh, so allows participants to explore, shape, and present ideas and feelings and their consequences. Uh, so I have a very quick adaptation of this theory. That's not a real project, that's not been published, we don't have data. And so Palambela is the Palambela Fair. Palambela is a Neolithic site in northern Greece that I was, ex I'm, I was excavating, I'm excavating there since I was an undergraduate student. It's a very big excavation, a joint Greek-British team from the University of Sheffield and Thessaloniki. So we found quite a lot of uh, that's the, one of the main trends. I'm here digging in the corner years ago, 2011, I think. So we found quite a lot of uh, these bowls, and it was a discussion between the archaeological team if how uh, effort needs to be in, in, uh, in a position to consistently produce these bowls. Because we, we have around 65, and between the bowls, if you are doing you know, all the uh, measurements, there are minor differences. They're literally identical to each other. So half of the people believed that these balls were produced home-based from uh, everybody can produce their own pots. The other half of the team believed that, no, one was the potter and he was the expert on this. So in, because we, we were exactly one professor in this team, the other professor in the other team, the local worker in one team, the local worker in the other, was a completely two uh, separated teams supporting and arguing. Uh, so we, we decided to visit a local potter and ask a potter to make 10 pots and ask the team who's actually saying about the home production to prepare 10 pots. As you can imagine, I mean, handmade following the Neolithic way, not well-made pots, handmade pots following the Neolithic way of making. So even the potter wasn't very specialist. Even though the 30-year-old, the, sorry, the 50-year-old, 30 years in, in the market, Yanis, our potter in Palambula, was made exceptionally consistent similar pots. You don't want to see the pots that the other team made. <laughs> <sighs> Mind the gap, last uh, or penultimate slides, uh, all this situation, it's not about reenactment. Because reenactment incorporates interpretation. And so even if you use reenactment, uh, as you know, we're doing that. So we, we reenact the battle in order to understand how the battle happened. So, but then, first, you do some interpretations before. So you cannot use reenactment. Reenactment is another thing. I like reenactment personally. I'm a, a favor of the reenactment. But on this approach, uh, reenactment is another story. Few acknowledgements, thanks to the Department of Archaeology and History of Art of Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, that uh, is my alma mater, and the Palambula Colindros Excavation Team. Uh, the Community Engagement Small Grant Scheme of Cardiff University paid the money in order to do the project in the National Museum of Wales, and also to do some research and do some collaboration with Cardiff Metropolitan University, and the lecturer there, Miss Jan Sava. Uh, and the National Museum of Cardiff, who hosted our uh, workshop. Uh, so, because we talked about uh, setting and scenery, uh, quite a lot of things changed in Palambala Hills. Hill, the scenery, the, it, it, the scene is the same from the Neolithic to today. So, I'm going to leave you with the sunset from Palambala Hill. Thank you all from me and from Captain. Johan Bach. Johan Bach.